Welcome to the ISO Show, dispelling myths and sharing tips for success to improve your business with ISO standards with your host, Mel Blackmore. Hello and welcome to the ISO Show. Well, today I'm delighted to be joined by Neil Binney, who's the Group Head of Information Security and Compliance at Morgan Sindel Group PLC. Morgan Sindel Group is a leading British construction and regeneration group. It's headquartered in London in the UK and it has a turnover of just over £3 billion, like it did in 2020, and it employs 6,700 employees. Another thing to note, uh, as we've been covering a number of podcasts on sustainability, Morgan Sindel have also impressively had a 64% reduction in carbon since 2010 too. But today we're actually going to be focusing on information security and how Neil and Morgan Sindel Group have been ahead of the curve as far as information security is concerned because Morgan Sindel have actually been certified to ISO 27001 for a couple of years now. In fact, they're coming up to their three-year recertification shortly. So I thought it'd be great to get Neil on as a guest because we've actually been working with Morgan Sindel for over a decade now and with various standards. And I thought it'd be really great for him to share his experience of ISO 27001 and his thoughts and views in relation to you know, the importance of information security in the construction industry. So before I hand over to Neil, I just wanted to highlight that Morgan Sintel Group is actually made up of eight complementary businesses within the construction industry. And so it's Neil's responsibility to manage that information security for the group. Okay, so without further ado, uh, welcome Neil. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for joining us today. So. Let's kick off with, you know, why information security in the construction industry? Why, why do you think that's important, Neil? Uh, thanks, Mark. So I think as you look at construction from the outside, it's all about collaboration. So we as an organization or as a, as a series of organizations in our industry share data with multiple groups. So we take client data that includes uh, floor plans or layouts, data from other industry sources, and we have to then create plans and project plans to share with various parties, which might include the supply chain. It could include partners on joint ventures. And we also have to share that data back to customers. Now, that can include personal data that would be regulated under GDPR. It could it contain commercially sensitive data, or it could include data that's sensitive to the client, including floor plans or layouts of buildings. But we have to share that data sensibly securely and in real time, which is why putting in an ISMS such as 27001 gave us such great benefit. So talking about benefits then, what would you say have been the greatest benefits then from having that framework in place? Well, I think we've always been aware of the importance of client security and, and the importance of data. What moving to a, a formal standard allowed the organisation to do was to, to show to the various stakeholders that we are doing it in a structured manner in accordance with international best practice. So when you try to do security, but without an overall framework, there's always a concern about what aren't we doing and what could be missing out. So aligning the organization and then ultimately accrediting to 27001 showed that we were meeting that best practice across all of the controls contained in 27002 when we did the initial assessment we were able to say well where do we exceed that control where do we meet that control and where are there areas that we may want to improve our, our current conformance against that control and ultimately allowing with the the iso standard and the, the approach of continuous improvement over the period that we've held the standard we have uh, allowed the teams to constantly lift the level of compliance over the, the three-year period great because I know for any business, regardless of the sector, I know that there can be quite a culture shift when it comes to ISO 27001. I think unlike, you know, compared to ISO 9001, where it's all about, you know, what you do as a business, ISO 27001, in some cases, 
means that there is, I guess, a change in mindset, I think, in terms of how data is treated within a company. So in terms of the benefits then, Neil, we can explore a bit more about the internal benefits. But there are potentially other things that we need to consider as well, I guess, in terms of supply chain as well. Could you just share a bit of insight into your thoughts around that then on benefits, please? Yes, Mel, I think that's a really hot topic just now in terms of what we've seen coming in from late last year from the US and now in the UK with the SolarWinds attack and the recent exchange attacks is that we're seeing a lot of um, the hackers are coming in using the supply chain. So in terms of our customers coming to us, both in government and in the private sector, they're looking for a reassurance that they're not going to fall victim to a supply chain attack from my organization. So having 27001 is a great baseline to say that we have a security management system in place. We've covered the basics and we believe we are meeting the best practice that they require. Okay, so could you just to kind of delve in a little bit deeper then, could you provide some examples on how a construction company could help to secure their supply chain? So I think as we look at the supply chain, the nature of the industry means that we have lots and lots of different suppliers. So we look both upstream and downstream. So while we are trying to assure that we are secure into the client and they are asking us for evidence of that, we also need to look further to our suppliers and see the people that are helping us to deliver services or product to the various sites or the various locations in which we deliver service. How do we make sure that they are also meeting industry best practice and securing our data or our customer data or even our, our employee data. So the 27001 certification provides a great common language that everybody can work against. So regardless of whether or not we require the supplier to be 27001 certificated, we at least have a series of standard questions that we can use to ask them about that. We are seeing a big uplift in the larger scale clients who are asking us for 27001 or equivalent. It used to be the case that you had a tender document that would say, are you 27001 certified and click yes. And if you clicked no, you then had another five pages or 10 pages of questions to answer. So there was a very big benefit to our tender and our, our bidding teams to be able to say, yes, we hold that certification for the IT function. Yeah, and I, th I think that's true in other industries as well. So like in terms of financial services, you know, if you're not ticking that box for 27,001, then all the questions, like you say, the five pages that kind of follow on from that are actually all based around 27,001 requirements anyway. So, <laughs> you know, I guess it, in terms of saving time and going through that, it's best, I guess, to get that framework in place from day one and then just continue to improve on that you know, based on that plan, do, check, act cycle that all the, the ISO standards are based on. Absolutely. We found that a very helpful approach to take with both talking to our clients to reassure them that we take their security and our security is very important. Absolutely. So talking about continuing improvement, could you just share with me a bit about Morgan Sindel's journey in relation to ISO 27001? Yes. So I, I joined the group just under three years ago at the start of its 27001 accreditation process. And the group was already working to a very high level of security and had been for several years. But there was an appetite both from within the group and being driven by some existing customers to, to get the badge that said we have 27001 to be able to reassure people both internally and externally to the group, including some, some senior stakeholders at the board level, that we were doing everything correctly. So working with Blackmores and BSI, we passed accreditation in December 2018 and have then gone through two successful annual certification cycles with the team. And happy to say that on each recertification within the three-year period, we've had fewer and fewer observations and are getting better as we go, which is what you would hope. We're now looking ahead to our three-year renewal in September of this year. Despite the challenges of COVID and lockdown, we're looking forward to that. And at this point, I think we're feeling fairly confident that that will be uh, the outcome that we need. What's interesting is where it goes from there is the ability to build on some of the, the new standards that we're seeing coming out. So, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because there seem to be a lot of sevens and twos here, but we have 27017, which is the cloud standard. 
and 27701, which is uh, data privacy. So those two standards, which I understand to be uplifts from 27001, are both quite interesting to us. We need to have a discussion internally as to, are we already following those best practices? Would we want to then formally accredit to those? But also in the industry, there's a wider conversation about, do we want to take another look at 22301 business continuity? And there's a new standard that's come out specifically for construction, uh, which is 19650, which is all about building information management. So with the emergence of digital building models, digital twin, and what we call the BIM model of AutoCAD, etc., there's a huge volume of data being contained in what 10, 15 years ago would have been a drawing is now a digital map. And that contains an awful lot of information that we need to secure in the right place. And it's great to see that uh, BSI and the ISO have learned from that and taken what was an old British standard, which was PAS 1192 part five. And that's now been launched as a, a new ISO standard. That's interesting, isn't it? Because I think there's clearly the demand is there then for it to go. I mean, it's quite often it's the UK that initiate standards of best practice by bringing together a collaboration of industry experts to create a British standard. But then as soon as other countries get to hear about it, and there is an appetite for it globally, then it does become an ISO standard. So yeah, it'd be interesting to see where that BIM standard goes. So, Similarly, with the data privacy standard that you mentioned, the ISO uh, 27701, up until a couple of years ago, that was a British standard as well. So that was, you know, BS 10,012. And it just goes to show that how important data privacy is, regardless of what sector you're in, that it is a, a global issue now. And, uh, you know, we need to be able to raise standards. But I think, you know, the fact that you've already got that 27,001 framework in place, Neil, is the fantastic foundation to then bring in elements of these other standards or even go for certification, you know, to those other standards. I think with both of those ISO 27 standards that you mentioned, you need to have ISO 27001 in place already. And I think what you've picked up on is how data is managed in the construction industry. There's such a, a collaboration across all of those requirements and at the end of the day there's generally regulations that underpin all of those areas. I don't think we've got anything yet on cloud security but I think that's only going to be a matter of time really isn't it until that becomes regulated as well. Yes I think there's what we're seeing with cloud security is there's a lot of competing international standards that are coming out from the USA so there's the uh, cloud security alliance there's a standard called STAR which you can accredit to but ultimately the ISO is still recognized as the global standard so that is the badge to which we would seek to accredit yeah and i think obviously a lot of the work's been done because you've got that 27001 framework already in place then it's i guess the next step i suppose yeah i think the international standards is great i still remember the days of bs 17799 and 799 but i think the move from that british standard with the kite mark into iso 27001 and then the revisions that the iso have brought in has shown that you know they're pushing themselves to that same continual improvement that they require their clients to hold yeah i think they've definitely come a long way and i think they're definitely more kind of not just looking at it from a commercial point of view in terms of what are the values and an roi from an organization actually implementing those controls but looking at the bigger picture i think now that all of these ISO standards that you've mentioned is based on that fundamental Annex SL framework. It means that it doesn't really matter what additional standard you bring into the business. At the end of the day, you've got the core fundamentals of the management system in place there already. And at the heart of that, quite often, is looking at the risks associated with the business, which we didn't have prior to the 2015 versions of these standards either. So, you know, one of the areas is context of the organisation, where we're looking at not just the internal opportunities and risks, but also looking at the bigger picture and looking at the external influencing factors, which of course, COVID has all kind of thrown us into, I think, turmoil, you know, this time last year in March, but obviously we've, we've learned a lot from that and moved forward from it. And I think a lot of organizations are, are innovating as a result of that. So it's also great to hear how Morgan Sindel are considering these other standards Again, being ahead of the curve and implementing best practice into your framework of operations. Well, we certainly hope so. The group operates, we talk internally that we operate over 300 sites pre-COVID. 
and we went from 300 sites to 4,000 sites. The benefit of having an ISMS in 27,001 is that we had a, a framework and a risk model which we could assess and say, if everybody started working from home due to COVID tomorrow, what does that do to our risk levels? What are the controls that we have? And where do we then have to make changes or amendments to those controls? So despite it being quite a stressful time for the organization in terms of dealing with the impact of the initial lockdown in 2020, we felt reassured that we had the correct security background and fundamental protection in place, as well as a management framework in which to make decisions. Yeah, I mean, it must have been extremely challenging for you in your position, you know, from everybody going from kind of office based to kind of remote working and how you tackled that. So having that system in place and of course, you know, business continuity is an element of ISO 27001 as well, isn't it? Which you mentioned ISO 22301 being the business continuity standard that you're looking at exploring in further detail as well. So, I mean, did it help, you know, having those business continuity plans in place when COVID kicked in in March 2020? Absolutely, Mel. I think we were talking about this the other day. We first remember talking about COVID back in, it was either late December or early January, where we were talking about emerging threat reports. And at the time it was, there's this new coronavirus, which we're hearing about in the news. Is it going to be another bird flu type pandemic? But what would we do? So there was some in a early scenario testing about what could happen, but that was more seen as a, an exercise but it laid the important groundwork so that when we actually did get to the point where it became very serious, you know, in a matter of days, we'd already started that thought process. As we look back at it now, it was almost a business continuity exercise in a nutshell that ourselves and, and many other UK companies, if not all, have had to go through with differing levels of ability to, to maintain operation. So one of the reasons for starting this podcast was that there are a lot of myths around ISO standards that I was quite keen to bust. So Neil, in terms of your experience, having gone through this kind of ISO 27001 journey, are there any kind of myths around ISO 27001 that you've come across that you think actually, no, that's just not right? I think for a lot of people, when they look at 27001 for the first time, Mel, it can be a bit daunting it's quite a heavy document and then you find out you've got 27001 and you've got this other document 27002 so understanding how they all hang together can be a bit nerve-wracking if you've not gone through it before so finding the right partner to help you guide the way is good but i would say to anybody looking at 27001 don't be scared of it it's pretty pragmatic sensible controls that any reasonably mature organization is going to be doing already what the 27001 standard asks you to do is, is think in a little bit more depth about how you do it and actually write it down. So that would be the main myth that I would dispel that, you know, 27001 requires a, a big team of paperwork and lots of documentation and lots of processes. It is possible to take a relatively lean approach to it. And most businesses, you're probably not as bad as you think you are. It's just about collating it and organizing it and getting it all written down. That's fantastic advice. Thanks for that, Neil. And so just finally, kind of on that theme, you know, in terms of lessons learned, are there any other hints or tips that you'd like to leave our ISO show listeners with today? Thanks, Mel. That's a great question. I think having been through 27,001 more than once now, I have done this in a different organization. One of the, the hints I would give to anybody looking at this is to get buy-in across the organization. ISO 27,001 is not a pure IT initiative you need to get your colleagues within human resources, finance, facilities, and operations, part of that journey and on board from day one. They have to have that buy-in. You'll need your legal team to support you as well in terms of engaging with legal authorities, etc. So there are parts of the standard that the IT team cannot and should not be doing on their own. So any aspiring 27,001 team has to take account of that and include people across the business. Okay, that's great. So definitely a collaborative approach to that, which I know that Morgan Sindel always applies to with any projects. So that's, uh, that's fantastic. Okay, well, thanks very much. You've been a brilliant guest today, Neil. Really enjoyed chatting to you and thanks very much for sharing those tips and insights as well. So thanks once again. It's been a real pleasure, Mel. Thank you for having me. Brilliant. Well, if anybody would like to hear more about some of those topics that we discussed, like data privacy standards, business continuity and cloud security. We have recorded other podcasts on that. 
over the last few episodes. So feel free to tune into that on the whatever play you're listening to, whether that's iTunes or, or Spotify, and you'll be able to find out a little bit more information on that. There'll also be a link to the Morgan Sindel Group website on our show notes if you'd like to find out a little bit more about what Morgan Sindel does as well. Thanks very much for listening and I look forward to catching you on the next ISO show. Looking to use ISO standards to drive better business practice? Contact us at blackmoorsuk.com to access further information and book your free 15-minute call.